What are quasars? When I was a kid, these things were very poorly understood. Huge power sources that were mysterious, and all we really knew were that they were very distant and ridiculously powerful. In the decades since, we've learned more about them, and the activities of supermassive black holes seem to account for their energy. But as the process of scientific breakthroughs continues, we learn more about these formerly mysterious objects. We know what they are now, and we can also classify them based on the stages at which the formation of them progresses. They are galaxies in the process of dying, and my guest studies this and has discovered a new stage in their development. Quasars have a cold stage after an apocalyptic hot or red stage. This is one of the most cataclysmic events one could witness if living in a galaxy. The worst calamities you could witness here on Earth pale in comparison to this. Earthquakes, storms, hurricanes, and even the swelling of the sun into a red giant pale in comparison to the death of a galaxy. So, here we go. You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Joining John in this episode is Dr. Alison Kirkpatrick. She received her PhD in astronomy at the University of Massachusetts and is a YCAA fellow at Yale University. She's an assistant professor at the University of Kansas and her recent work on quasars and supermassive black holes has yielded surprising findings on an entirely new class of cold quasar. Welcome everyone to Event Horizon with me, John Michael Godier. If you enjoy what you hear, fall into the event horizon, hit the like button, and become an active subscriber by ringing the bell. Dr. Kirkpatrick, welcome to the program. Hi, thanks for having me. Now, Doctor, you work with quasars, which is a sort of a bizarre stage in the life of some galaxies. Could you give us an overview of what quasars are? Sure. So quasars are kind of this catch-all term that gets thrown around a lot. So when we in the community use it, we are referring to the brightest supermassive black holes in the universe. And when we say that a black hole is bright, what we mean is that the material right around the black hole is very bright. The black hole itself is black, but material falls on, material that gets too close to the black hole falls onto it. And not all the photons are captured by the black hole itself. And those photons become very luminous and we can see them. Particularly, as everyone knows, this has been in the news recently with the Event Horizon Telescope, we can, we can see very close to a black hole. So quasars are the most massive of supermassive black holes. They're not your everyday supermassive black hole. They're the biggest ones and they're found in the biggest galaxies and they eat a lot of material. And so when they start accreting a lot of material, they get very, very, very bright. And that is what qualifies them as a quasar, is their brightness. These are basically the most powerful objects in the universe that we know of, right? These supermassive black holes involved with the quasars? Yes, correct. And in fact, we don't see them today very much at all in our local universe. And the reason that is, is because things that are very massive evolve and die very quickly. And so these quasars are something that we tend to see in the very distant universe. And then they've already eaten all the material around them. Uh, and now we see them as passive elliptical galaxies. So they essentially you have to look back in time in order to see them. And that this, this phenomena doesn't really happen in the universe as it is today. Right. It's really, it's really rare to find them today. But do they? I mean, do you observe quasars, a say, so-called, I guess, modern quasar? Do these things still occasionally appear? in the local universe? Yeah, absolutely. So you can, um, what's required to, to trigger a quasar is a, is a whole bunch of, of gas being dumped onto it. And in the local universe, you can do that by taking two gas-rich disk spirals and slamming them together. And then that will 
push a whole bunch of material towards the center of the galaxy and ignite these supermassive black holes. And so we have a population that we think will turn into quasars, and these are what we call ultra-luminous infrared galaxies. And they have very, very massive black holes that are actively accreting that are currently buried under dust. And we think that these will become like modern-day quasars. Now, is it possible, because we're currently careening towards the Andromeda galaxy, could we become a quasar in this galaxy? Yes, almost, almost certainly that will happen. So, so fun fact about the Milky Way, the Milky Way is actually slowing down in its star formation. And this is this is something that's not not really well understood, but the Milky Way is not actively forming a lot of stars anymore even though it has a lot of gas and dust in it. But when we slam into Andromeda, we'll have a brief few hundred million years where star formation in our galaxy gets ignited and we have a whole new population of stars being formed. With your work regarding the cold quasars, this is just an intermediate stage in the death of a galaxy where it starts blowing out the dust eventually. Mm -hmm. And you you know, that originally there were two types, but you found a type where the it's a cold quasar. It's not sort of the, the reddened gas filled disk. Rather, it's an intermediate stage before the galaxy actually dies and star formation stops. Could you go into that? Yeah. So. So let's talk about the, the death cycle of galaxies. So after you have galaxies that have slammed into another and have, have ignited their, their black hole, typically the first quasar stage is a dust reddened quasar stage. And we call these red quasars because we're not super creative in our naming. And these are these are things where the, the black hole is, is just beginning to accrete a lot of material and there's a lot of material around it as well, producing the reddening. When you have a lot of dust around something, dust reddens things. It absorbs a lot of UV and optical light. So these, these things, you can still see spiral shapes. You can still see tidal arms. You can still see a lot of stars being formed. And then the other type of quasar is a blue unobscured quasar. Blue because there's no dust in the center obscuring the accretion disk. So what the light that we are seeing is the light from the accretion disk onto the black hole. And that accretion disk is so bright it can outshine the entire host galaxy. And so we'll see x-rays from those, we'll see the accretion disk, and we'll still see a little bit of dust that, that's right next to the black hole itself, but not, not a whole lot. And these things typically don't have cold dust in them. Cold dust is something that when we see it, it signifies star formation. So cold, the coldest dust in a galaxy lies in the interstellar medium, and it is what stars are, are formed from, like with, within these, these dust clouds, cold dust clouds. And the dust is mixed with, with cold gas. That is the fuel for star formation. And so when we see cold dust, that means that there is some kind of host galaxy there where dust can cool to these temperatures and there is star formation still happening. So we found blue, luminous, unobscured quasars, and then they have more cold dust than we've ever seen before in, in any kind of unobscured quasar population. So their host galaxy is still there. So essentially this is just the, the blowing out of the dust as a result of the merger and, and gas for that matter. And now this should spark a lot of star formation, right? Yes, yes. And in fact, in fact, in a couple of my galaxies, their star formation rates are 2000 solar masses a year. And to put that in perspective for you, the Milky Way forms about one solar mass per year. Now, this this sounds like an apocalyptic environment. <laughs> and if and if the Milky Way, if this is going to happen to us and, we, you know, I'm sure we won't be around for it, but say we were, what would this look like from, you know, a planet? from Earth, would would this be just an extinction event? I mean, would this just kill everything in a galaxy? What would it do? That's a great idea. I imagine for the time that we could see it, it would look amazing. At the beginning, it wouldn't affect us so much. All of the activity is happening in the center of the galaxy. And the Earth is pretty far from the center of the galaxy. So we're, we're about 32,000 light years away from the center of the galaxy. Uh, so we'll be fine for 32,000 years, at least. And what this wind is going to do, what the, what, what the quasar activity is going to do, is number one, it'll be the brightest thing in the night sky. It'll, it'll outshine everything. But as feedback from the energy being generated around the black hole begins to propagate through the galaxy, 
you're going to get a lot more star formations. We call this positive feedback. So what happens is what, what triggers star formation is when you have a cold cloud that suddenly gets compressed and gets compressed that gravity becomes strong enough that it begins collapsing that cloud into a star. So you can imagine that if there's these winds sweeping through the galaxy, that's a lot of shocks and a lot of compression and a lot of clouds getting compressed. So that's what's gonna trigger the burst of star formation. Now, that burst of star formation is gonna be the beginning of the end for, for Earth because what's gonna happen is that's going to trigger a whole bunch of supernova eventually. Again, we have another million years in there. So we're gonna get a whole bunch of supernova after a million years and the most massive stars have died and the supernova output cosmic rays and those cosmic rays will be close enough that they will actually be deadly for life on Earth if life is still around at this point in time. So I would say, you know, after the blue quasar phase, we have about a million and a half years. When is this merger going to start? About five billion years from now. So the sun will probably be a red giant yeah. by that stage and have likely swallowed Earth. Right. But what effect would it have on the sun? Is this something that could change the sun, you know, this wind, or otherwise change the equation for the future solar system? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. Probably, probably not. It would change the, it could change the orbit. And in fact, what could happen is we might actually get knocked in closer to the center of the galaxy. And that's, that's no good. If you want to continue, let's, let's say that we've moved to a further planet. We talk a lot about you know, Goldilocks zones of planets and where you want to be relative to a star, there's actually also a Goldilocks zone in the galaxy. And so you don't want to be too close to the center. You don't want to be close to basically any burst of star formation because you don't want to be showered with cosmic rays when all the supernova go off. But will it change the actual sun itself? No, but it'll prevent any new stars from being formed eventually around here. So we'll be after the wind sweeps through the galaxy and all the stars have been formed and all the supernova have gone off, then we'll be stuck with the stars that we're stuck with. And we'll probably want to find a nice M dwarf star to live around. That, of course, those live for much, much longer time periods. Yeah. So this is essentially analogous to a hurricane passing through. And once, once the hurricane passes through, the community basically gentrifies and just is dead. Everything is dead. And this is essentially the death of our... <laughs> the, de the future death of the Milky Way is to just run out of gas. Yes, that's right. Past that, though, once this happens and we're past the quasar stage, the cold quasar stage, mm -hmm. then we have the dead galaxy. But the story doesn't really end there because you still have all of the stars and you still have this coalescing of two galaxies. So the future is an elliptical galaxy, right? Yeah. Does that change the dynamics of, of the galaxy dramatically? Is it just, is it still spinning? What's it doing at this point? Yeah, okay. So this is actually, this gets to the definition of an elliptical galaxy. Of what, what is it versus a spiral galaxy? So in a spiral galaxy, we are all orbiting the center of the Milky Way, much like our planets are orbiting the sun. It's nice and orderly. We're all going the same direction. We're all going in a plane. An elliptical galaxy is is just pure chaos. Every star goes in whatever direction it wants to. That's what gives it the elliptical shape. My last question for you, Doctor, is the merging of supermassive black holes in this whole process. Okay. What does that look like? <laughs> I mean, these are black holes, and obviously black holes don't really emit much energy, but their accretion disks do. So what happens to these accretion disks when these two black holes from the centers of these galaxies merge? Oh my gosh. Okay, so this is such a good question. So first of all, the merging of black holes is something that we can we can only really witness in computer simulations because with telescopes, we can't resolve them when they're that close. So we can see two galaxies that are in the process of colliding and we can see what's called dual AGN, where an, an AGN is an active galactic nucleus or a feeding black hole. And so we can see that both galaxies colliding would have feeding black holes. And so we know that those black holes collide. We don't really know the time scales for it. The accretion disks themselves would also merge. I imagine that things would kind of just get sloshed around together until you become one accretion disk. You'd probably get a very asymmetrical accretion disk. So we see this when two stars get close together, that one star gets gets very distorted and material gets literally pulled 
pulled off of that star. So I imagine the same thing would happen with the accretion disk. But what's really interesting about this, just to, to give all your listeners nightmares, is that you can actually kick one of the black holes out of the galaxy, and then you can have a wandering black hole. And we know that this happens because we've observed it, like, like once there's a couple yeah there's one really solid confirmation where we've seen an AGN or an actively accreting black hole in the very outskirts of a galaxy so this this has to be something that has gotten kicked out but simulations show that it should be quite common and so we we could have just wandering black holes out there that we have no hope of seeing but then the two the two black holes actually merging together and what that process is like the way that we can get them to spiral in together, they need to lose energy, and that energy will be given off in gravitational waves. And the way that we will detect that is through the upcoming mission, LISA, which will be launched in space. It's going to be like LIGO, which did the gravitational waves on the ground, but in space. And it's going to be capable of seeing, seeing metaphorically, the mergers of two supermassive black holes. So there's a gravitational signature, but once it happens, if this black hole, like as you said, got kicked out, you can't see it anymore. So it's a wandering. Yeah. It's like the sharks of the universe yeah. wandering around. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you for joining us, doctor. All right. Thank you. So will the Milky Way die, so to speak, as a quasar? A last hurrah until all that's left is an elliptical mess with no new star formation. Rather, the remaining stars within it will die, leaving only the ancient red dwarfs to eke out a living for a time like nibbling mice in a dead universe, living on the legacy gases they collected long ago, and can only take advantage of because their small size allows for confection. Other stars are usually not that lucky, their fates being left to explosion. But then eventually the efficient red dwarfs die too, and transition to blue dwarfs, an object the universe is not yet old enough for something like that to even exist. By this time, the sun will be a cooling cinder as well. And imagine that, we go through a phase of occasional quasars as the ancient galaxies merge. Then they become ambiguous. If anyone is left in the very far future, they will exist in a universe that they can't even meaningfully observe. They would know less about the universe than we do now. Much would be a permanent mystery to them, though they may glean scant details. It would be a universe of cool ancient red stars, very hard to even observe. They would live under black skies, the universe having expanded so much that little would be viewable. And there would be stellar remnants, also very hard to see, white dwarfs and black holes. But cosmology of any sort becomes hard at that stage, though some form of it may still be possible. They may even have ideas of how the universe began, but no way to study it. They may have ancient information, our current science, but by then has become a sort of creation myth. They will have nothing close to the information that we have available to us now. The universe to them will be a fever dream, from which they have very few clues about, even if they discover whatever they can about science. I'm glad that I live in the relatively early stages of the universe. John! Yes, Anna? What do you think you'll be doing during the final moments of the galaxy? Wait! What? I'll be a victim of entropy by then. You already are. Beard maintenance, remember? Always about the beard. I think the whole thing will be sad, though. The dying Milky Way. It is an excellent way to defeat the Borg, though. Why would we need to defeat the Borg? They're fictional, right? No reason, John. No reason at all. You're not exactly Borg Queen material, Anna. Oh. And on that note, next week's show will be Duncan Forgan for a discussion of astrobiology and the universe in general. See you then.